Hello and welcome to the Vilnius Jewish Public Library. Can you hear me, Samuel? I hear you very well. It's a pleasure to be with you. Every September reminds us uh, not only about the upcoming uh, Jewish High Holidays, but also about the tragic events that took place here in Vilnius more than 80 years ago. In September 1941, a Jewish ghetto was established in Vilnius. It was liquidated on September 23rd, 24th of um, 1943. For many years, on September 23rd, we mark the day of the genocide of Lithuanian Jews. According to Abraham Sutsk uh, Avram Sutskever's testimony at Num uh, Nuremberg's trials, there were 80,000 Jews lived in Vilnius before the war, of whom remained only 600. Today we paid our last respect to one of the uh, survivors, uh, Fania Jocheles Brantsovskaya. Now I would like us um, all to honor uh, her memory as well as the memory of all victims of the Holocaust, including the father and grandparents of our guest Samuel Buck, the minute of silence. Here in our library, we have many books with stories and testimonies about those horrible times. But it's so exceptional that today we have an opportunity to speak to a person who went through it all himself. It's a big honor to introduce our today's, uh, today's guest, a world famous painter, Samuel Buck. Hello, Samuel. Thank you. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be to be with you, uh, you know, uh, uh, I exist in, in Vilnius. The Samuel Bach Museum has more than, a, than two or three or four years of my life in the works that it uh, has in its collection. So it's, um, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, Vilna or Vilnius today is part of me. And it is wonderful to feel that I am part of it in the reality of today. So it's great to be with you. Yeah, it's also really wonderful to, to have you here. Um, and to make our conversation more lively, uh, here next to me, I have two very close friends of Samuel. One of them is Yeva Shadjavicene. She's a chief curator of Samuel Bach Museum at the Vilnius Gaon Jewish uh, History Museum. And also we have Rima Testankiewicz, a very good friend of painter, and have actually thanks of him, um, we, Samuel back uh, returned to Vilnius, but we will talk about it. Um, and also I would like to invite you all to be part of this conversation. So if during the conversation you will have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, ask. And um, so let's start. Um, and I would like to start with a question about your childhood, Samuel. Your childhood here in Vilnius. Can you tell us more? What do you remember about your childhood in Vilnius? Oh, I, I remember my childhood very well, you know. <laughs> Memory uh, is always kind of uh, recreating itself uh, new. And uh, I can, uh, and I have a very early memory and I have a, a kind of a, an enormous library of videos of this memory in my head where I can see our apartment, I can see the courtyard. We lived on what was called then Vilenska number 10. I think it, the house has now a different uh, number. When I, for the first time, came to Vilnius, I uh, tried, I, I went up the staircase, I tried to look at the, at the place, actually, of uh, um, our apartment, only the windows remained. But in my memory, it lives the way it was, with its furniture, with its um, wallpaper, with the smells of the of the house plants, and uh, and I must say, 
that I have a very vivid and a wonderful and very happy memory of of old Vilnius, of my my four grandparents who loved me very much. I was a very spoiled brat. I was a child uh, uh, that came first, a first grandchild, first child of my parents. So you can imagine the attention that I got and and how I was able as a child to manipulate uh, uh, them. Uh, I, I remember very well getting out from uh, my uh, house, uh, crossing the Vilenska street, just in front of the house was the little Monushko square. And I had my tricycle where I would go around this strange Monushko, which was a head and 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 the bust and this poor man they cut off his hands they cut off his feet uh, they were not there <clears throat> but um, in our house uh, uh, we had always a lot of friends of my parents I was as a child I think very interested in. Um, in in what the grand uh, gra the the uh, old people were talking the old for me was everyone um, starting from age ten up and um, I was always interested in what they were uh, saying to each other but I also had great friends of my of my childhood uh, there was Samek the friend. Um, my, was decided that he was my best friend because he was the son of my mother's best friend, Manya. And with Samek, we used to play a lot. And uh, tragically, Samek was found by the, by the Nazi police and, um, and uh, he was machine gunned uh, uh, on the staircase of the house in which he was hidden. He was then nine years of age or seven years of age. I, I don't remember exactly. I think it was in, he was born in 33 and this happened in 41. So, well, anyway, um, I must say the wonderful memories that I have of the Polish kindergarten in which I was. And then I was taken over into a, a Yiddish speaking kindergarten because my mother decided that I should have a better understanding of our culture. We were a very um, secular family. There was only my grandmother, Shifra, who used to go twice or maybe three times a year to the synagogue for the high holidays. She used to slap along with her my grandfather who for the sake of domestic peace agreed to go to the synagogue although he was an a proclaimed atheist this was on my mother's side on my father's side they didn't go to the synagogue at all because uh, my grandfather Chaim, Chaim Bach when he was a young uh, man was a uh, socialist, he was a Bundist. Uh, these were the people who in some way brought the uh, moral vision of the of the Bible into the life of the then the beginning 20th century. Taking care of the others, while usually uh, they lived in a system uh, of the of the of the Russian Empire, in which there was no care for the others. It was the care of the aristocracy for itself and its interests. So the care for the others it was very much developed in the Jewish community because of the of the culture that the Bible inspired them. Also in the Christian community, I guess uh, it was the same taking care of orphans, taking care of poor people. Uh, the rich people were having to make donations to the community so that the others uh, would, be, be, would be taken care of. But anyway, I'm not going to go into the history of the political movements of that time. 
my my grandfather Chaim uh, Chaim um, uh, in nineteen five when the um, when 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 the revolution against the Tsar failed, he uh, he was on the list of people to be arrested. He escaped. I described all this in my book, painted in words. So uh, whoever is interested uh, can find the book. I understand that the Lithuanian version of this book um, is uh, is by now uh, gone, but uh, you still have it there. That's wonderful. And um, uh, the English version exists also, of course, as, a, as an ebook. So this this whoever reads English can get it uh, very easily. All these stories I tell, and and in my childhood, I I was told the stories of my grandparents. So somehow, in my own memory, I carry in me generations of 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 people who who were in the world before me. That as a child amazed me because I thought all these people worked so hard to make me. So this gave me also, of course, the sense that I must make them happy. And in some way, this very childish um, idea of making them happy exists in me until this very day. Now that I'm 91, I'm speaking of them. I'm speaking of the old uh, Vilnius that existed so many years ago. And it it, it it feels it feels absolutely wonderful because all these things, thanks today to to what you have um, set up here, uh, we can bring them back to life. Because uh, there is something very important to say about the Jewish community of Vilnius, the eighty thousand people. There were very different strata of that population. There was a certain strata of people that had means, uh, that believed, like my my parents, that um, skies were the limit. That if I spoke a good Polish, I will be accepted at the university. I will be able to become a I don't know what. But um, the, there was a very large, very poor Jewish population. Part of this Jewish uh, poor population was still religious. They still kept uh, their um, traditional beliefs of, of the diaspora of um, years ago. There was a commercial uh, strata, like my grandparents in some way. They belong to the people that, that, that did uh, commerce. But there was also culturally uh, a, a part of the Jewish, uh, of the Jewish uh, population sp believed in the importance of the Yiddish language. Part of it believed in the importance of the Hebrew language. So there were those two possibilities of education. The Hebrew education had a more Zionist, uh, inspiration in it, the Yiddish population, a more socialist one. In fact, it is known that the very huge um, uh, communities of Litvaks that um, in the those very troubled years of the beginning of the of the twentieth century escaped uh, some of them to Argentina, some of them to um, South uh, Africa. They all developed a certain continuation of the Litvak mentality, the Litvak need for studies, the 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 the, 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 the keeping a, a, in alive the Yiddish language. Lasted for one generation. Kaczerginski, for instance, Kaczerginski became the secretary of the uh, Yiddish community. Uh, in Argentina, and uh, and that is how he perished in a in a in a um, uh, plane crash, where he was traveling from one place to another to gather information and to present things. So Kaczerginski, I think, died in 
I'm, you know, I, 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 I apologize. At ninety-one years, one has some, some, some problems with memory. But um, he, I, I, around fifty-six, fifty-seven, there was this, a plane crash in which he perished. And it's very strange. This man, who was a partisan, who was such a hero in the, in the, uh, ghetto who was a very devoted communist, very devoted communist. Uh, and then, of course, escaped communism <laughs> because he he suddenly had the possibility of seeing it, what it was and what it was for the Jewish population in the Soviet Union. And he escaped and uh, through Paris, he later found this uh, job in, um, in um Argentina. But I remember him as one of the very first men who took, who, who, who wrote down testimonies of people. And I don't know if his book, The Destruction of Vilnius, was translated into other languages. In Yiddish, it is called Kurm Vilna, which means the um, destruction of Vilnius. And what is it? so extraordinary in this book and I'm speaking about it because I hope that one day maybe there will be a Lithuanian translation into that is that for instance there were at least 10 or 12 accounts of the same event in the Hakape camp in Vilnius in which I was after the liquidation of the ghetto which is of course at the date of, that we now commemorate. And uh, uh, the children that were with the parents in the, in the camp were taken away. And uh, this uh, terrible trauma has its very first witnessing in the in the um, notes that um, Kaczorginski took down on on that occasion, it was I remember I was I was a boy of ten, but but you know I I can, I can see this this kind of brown old apartment in which he and Sutskiver lived and maybe some other people in Vilnius because Vilnius I, I must say of uh, uh, forty four when the Russian took it over had very many buildings bombed, many buildings that lost windows and so on. We lived for for some time in in, in a part of an apartment that was that was still possible. I mean um, and and then we lost it because um, there was a big an enormous explosion of a train in the uh, uh, the railway um, station of Russian ammunition. And uh, of course, no one knew exactly why it happened. It was most of, probably been um, the work of um, nationalists or maybe just an accident. And so many windows that remained in Vilnius flew out. And I remember the streets of Vilnius uh, covered by millions of pieces of glass. <laughs> from windows uh, from which people took off then the paper that was sticking to the glass so that the glass wouldn't shatter and fall into the street. So I I'm sorry I went into details. <laughs> yeah, and I think and I think we can even see some of those glass pieces of yeah, glass right. in your paintings right. but some more yeah you already started to talk about ghetto and what happened after but i would like to go back and i would like to ask you did you as a child did you feel any signs that something horrible can happen soon before it happened um uh, and, and i remember what i remember very well my, my own feeling that this thing called war was the most wonderful thing that could have happened to me. First of all, there was a Russian general who kicked out my grandparents from their apartment and they went to live with my other grandparents. So now I had my four grandparents living in the same apartment. This was wonderful. Then so many interesting people came from Warsaw. 
they were they were um uh they were escaping, of course, all these things I, I, I learned later, but they came to us and they will, and, and in our home evenings, we're always with lots of people around the table and people were speaking of politics and were screaming and were laughing and were telling jokes and were uh, many, some of them, I think, were waiting for a certain um, lit, uh, Japanese Japanese uh, consul and um, and for me then Japanese Chinese was the same thing and all I wanted was wondering if this consul in Kaunas had a kind of a long 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 uh, um, hair uh, uh, hanging on the uh, on, on, on his back and he was probably had a kind of a triangular hat. I mean, I, 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 my, my parents, my grandparents tried to keep all their worries away from me. I should see the thing, but also wonderful things happened because my grandfather, my mother's father, had this huge aquarium for fish, and suddenly I was able to have this aquarium, and this is wonderful fish, and these wonderful fish arrived in buckets to our home. And um, and our our house uh, homemade Xenia washed the aquarium with well well with green soap, and then they put the fish into the water, and all the fish died, poisoned by the green soap of the cleanliness of um, the aquarium. So, but but all these were wonderful stories and um, a lot to talk about, a lot to speak. Um, I, I actually learned about what really happened to me later, later, of course, um, when, uh, we were liberated and after about a couple of weeks, my mother returned crying. She learned that my father was dead and she embraced me and she said, your father is gone. Uh, it is, I think, maybe for the first time that I really realized the total uh, weight of the tragedy. Uh, I, my, my family tried to give me a very happy life. And I think that this sense of of love that I have received from them, this enormous security that dwelt in me that I could rely on them, on their love. But even when at a certain point, and I describe it in my book, I stood with my mother on a, on, on, on a bridge and looked into the water, and my mother was thinking now, do I have the courage to take my son in my hands and jump into the water and kill myself? Uh, I didn't know what was going on in her head. And only at a certain point, she took me and we ran and we we arrived to the convent and Sister Maria Mikulska opened us the door and we were, we were saved. But it was when my own children were playing in the, uh, on, on, on the grass of my home in Israel, so many years later, did my mother tell me, you know, I must confess that uh, there was a moment in which I, I was determined to kill myself and you because we were in such a despair. We did not know where to hide. We did not know how to escape. These were the last months of Vilnius before the liberation. So you see, uh, the Holocaust, the reality of the things, all that in its completeness, was not something I was aware of when I was living it. I learned about it later, and relatively fast. Uh, when I was 15, 16, 17, of course, I learned it. And it was an important learning, and I learned it also with a certain specific vision of things. But I must say that what makes me belong to 
Vilnius so very much was the fact that I survived uh, with a certain small number of people who have survived, all of them from Vilnius or Kaunas. They were, they were somehow together. Even in the Dipikian, the, the uh, administration of the camp were all Litvaks. <laughs> my my uh, stepfather, who my mother married in forty six in the DP camp. Uh, we called him Markusha. He was from Kaunas. He lost his wife. He lost his uh, two daughters. Um, he was um, a very cultured uh, man, a big chess player. And uh, somehow old Vilnius lived on with me. Uh, I was already almost an adult and I still heard stories of for the from of the past about people of the past uh, so all this is i was imbued by 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 all these stories and it landed in me and it is a, a deposit and an, an incredibly precious deposit for me all this litvakhood i would say that i have received from them Okay, um, let's go back again and let's yeah. um, talk about the beginning um, Thursdays uh, of um, 1941, uh, September. Do you remember? Creation of the all... ghetto. Yes, yes, I remember. It was a moment we were, uh, we were, uh, we, my mother and I were at home. Uh, my father was already in a camp. He was cutting some turf. Uh, we were not allowed to come out from our house. We were, had uh, no telephone. We had no radio. All these things were taken away. Uh, we were very lucky that our maid, Ksenia, remained with us. So she was able to go to the market and barter some stuff that we had uh, against potatoes or other things. Um, again, as I as I told you before, I, I described some details of these stories in in my book. Uh, we were something was happening. I remember that a few days before, some people came to saying that um, the the authorities have. Uh, uh, demanded from the community a certain amount of money, a, a huge amount of money in gold and silver. Otherwise, some people of the of the heads of the community will be executed and so on. And I remember there was already a big tension and I understood that things were not the way they used to be. And then there was some banging on the door and then two men came in, an older one, a younger one, they were obviously Lithuanians who collaborated with the uh, uh, Nazis and uh, they said, take with you very quickly what you can carry and, um, and, and, and go down into the courtyard. And I then rushed quickly. I, 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 I rushed to my uh, uh, bedroom and the, and and I tucked in my uh, teddy bear so that he would sleep well. Told him goodbye, and I uh, I I uh, didn't know what. My mother had a little suitcase that she took, and she at the last moment took a pillow from the bed and gave me the pillow. Said, "Oh, this is something very important, uh, because wherever we will uh, be, we will be able to put our head on that and sleep well." So we left very quickly the apartment. I still remember our our, our Xenia and uh, and the and some other uh, woman. I, I I think the uh, she must have been working in this uh, for the building, and they were looking at us with strange expression. I could not read into that expression very much. 
were they happy that we were gone and they were they remained with all that was left no idea no idea but we were taken we were taken to the courtyard in the courtyard there were other jews that lived in the same building uh, we were all soaked uh, by the rain that was falling and and then at a certain point they told us um, now you go out and join the line of the people that are in the street and in the street in fact there was a big line of people walking one behind the other. Some were carrying some stuff uh, that they could um, quickly pack. And we were all walking in this uh, big line of water that was accumulating between the road and between the sidewalk. We were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. Jews were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. And um, and my by my the pillow that I was carrying became soaked and became so heavy that I told my mother I cannot carry it and I, I threw it away and I saw some people walk over it it remained uh, and we arrived to the ghetto and in the ghetto it was it was packed the street was was packed and uh, and then suddenly we we saw their niece and I can say. <laughs> I can still see, see him. He had some keys in his hand. His daughter used to live in the area in which the ghetto was created, an area from which all the Jews were taken to Ponari and executed to make the apartments empty and available to us. And he brought us up a staircase. The people didn't yet enter these places because many of them were closed. And he entered, and I remember you could see that people were taken out from there very quickly. And uh, uh, and then uh, somehow um, we walked, we entered a shop, we walked into another courtyard with my mother, and... Uh, she tried to to get an idea how we could escape the ghetto, but we still remained for one night. We, I remember we slept in the ghetto. I remember that there was some screaming in the staircase. Somebody, a man committed suicide by hanging himself. Uh, we, we kind of managed, my mother and I, to get out from the ghetto. So uh, by miracle, it was because they have not yet closed entirely all the windows, all the all the the passages that existed, because the ghetto was improvised very fast. Uh, so we were able, and um, miraculously, we 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 uh, got to my uh, grandfather. Um, Connor's sister, Aunt Yanina, she converted to Christianity when she was uh, about 14 or 15 years of age and brought up in a convent of um, which that had a school. And uh, and then the story goes on. It's a very long story. So I, 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 I wonder in which details you would be interested how long you stayed there, there and what happened? Why did you come back to the ghetto? Can you tell us oh, uh, the oh, story? Yes, of course. Uh, we were, uh, we were um, with my aunt Janina for several days. And uh, I remember also that my aunt Yeta managed to arrive to her, my um mother sister um uh, they were uh, both very close to Yanina and uh, Yanina managed to have uh, for us a room in the Benedictine convent that was uh, just behind the Monusco square it was a big big convent it was um, part of, I, I, I believe it was St. Catherine Church, if I'm not mistaken. And um, 
uh, she got for us a room. She had a dispensation of the um, Archbishopy uh, for us to enter the what it was called the clausura, which means an area where the, the, where only nuns had an access there. No foreigner was allowed there, and they found a way of hiding. Uh, there, uh, my parents, my father managed to escape from his camp where he was cutting tar turf, which was outside of Vilnius. I don't remember now the, the, the name of that camp. Uh, he um, joined us and Uncle Yasha and, and Yeta came. They had a little girl, Tamara, uh, but she remained with Aunt Yanina. Uh, she was blonde, she had clear eyes, she, she was uh, supposed to be a Christian child. So we were in that uh, convent for uh, quite a number of, of months, but my father has created a hiding under the roof in case the convent is searched by German uh, by German authorities. But then uh, one uh, morning, uh, many trucks came, surrounded the convent, and told the nuns, um, you will now be expulsed from the convent, uh, arrested, and um, the convent will become a, a German... A German uh, uh, institution, uh, the Rosenberg, the Rosenberg uh, uh, administration will uh, collect their books and uh, have also their headquarters. Um, okay, I would like to move uh, to the moment um, at the ghetto. Uh, then uh, your teacher, uh, Rochel uh, Sarabski, you had a teacher. Uh, can you say a few words about her? Well, she was she was a lovely person. She worked she worked hard during the day. I don't remember exactly what she was doing, cleaning streets or doing something like that. She worked in one of those units of Jews that uh, left the ghetto. I mean, uh, you must uh, also remember that the, the ghetto that was packed with uh, close to 50,000 people uh, could not survive with this density. So the Germans were interested to, 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 to um, exploit the manpower of the ghetto for work uh, so that the ghetto has to be reduced. So with all kinds of excuses of people who were given um, uh, kind of permits of work, red permits, yellow permits, green permits, and so on, they uh, came and took out waves of the Jewish population. The older people, the sick people, and so on, brought them to Ponari and executed them. And um, when the ghetto was about, was about reduced to 20,000 or even a little less, inhabitants uh the, the the those actions of of death um stopped and people were only from time to time arrested from time to time executed but um people were working in those units of work so rochele my 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 teacher who my mother found for me so that i wouldn't go to the school, which I refused to go, that was always packed with children, always shaved heads, and it kind of scared me. Uh, Rochele took it on herself that in days in which she was working hard outside and returning to the ghetto around five and six, around eight, she would be available to teach me. So my school was, but 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 I was I loved learning from her. Uh, 
learning from her uh, to ri write, read Yiddish, uh, uh, Polish, which was actually the language that I spoke with my parents. And um, she also uh, admired my artistic, my artistic talent. And she is the one who brought me to Sutskiver. She knew very well Sutskiver, and um, and and then what followed was my exhibition. Uh, was not, was not my exhibition. Was my great participation in the exhibition of the artists of the ghetto. Yes, I ask about Rachel because uh, she is also mentioned in um, Abraham Sutzkever's uh, newly uh, translated books, uh, book to, to Lithuanian language, uh, his memoirs from, uh, from Vilnius Ghetto. And he's writing here um, about uh, how he met you. Yeah. And he, um, I will not uh, translate everything, but I will say a few phrases. Uh, so basically, you ask him, what is um, uh, expressionism? And uh, you ask him to paint it. And, um, and he said, I don't know how to paint it. Uh, and then you ask, how can you not, um, why can you paint something what you know? Uh, and then he said that uh, the situation showed him that there is a very um, special person in ghetto, and his name is Samuel Buck. So it was <laughs> your. <laughs> this is uh, how he describes um, uh, your. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's true. It's, I I had a very good I had a very good relationship with uh, with Sulzkiver. I um, I f I think that he made me feel very. He made me feel very special, but. Um, he, he, I remember his tiny room. It was a tiny room where there was a cupboard and there were about two beds. Uh, one was his and his his wife's. One was um, one was Kaczorginski. The wife of Kaczorginski lived outside of the ghetto because she wasn't Jewish. And um, he had, I think, he had there two art books on top of this cupboard. And uh, one of the books, uh, and, and this is how he was speaking to me about art. One of these books was by Pasternak, uh, the art of Pasternak. Pasternak was the father of the famous Pasternak who had a Nobel Prize for Literature and who wrote Dr. Zhivago, who was a very, very famous novel in the, I would say in the 60s of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, last of the 20th century. Uh, I don't know if anyone has heard about Dr. Zhivago today. <laughs> and it made also a big film. But um, Pasternak was a very fine painter and this was a book of reproductions and he was showing them to me. And he was always, all, all, he had always something, I, I think by, by Chagall. And he, he was very, uh, very proud of his friendship with Chagall because when Chagall visited Vilnius and by the way made also a, a couple of watercolors of the big synagogue in Vilnius which I think have remained and exist and are in some way a document of, of somebody who visited the great synagogue. Uh, so he he uh, he spoke to me quite a lot about uh, that and and also about art and then I remember I think it was also somehow with his help or some friends of his gave me a big package of postcards of the paintings of the Louvre and this is how <laughs> I was introduced to the big art of um, of the world. On these postcards, I carry these postcards with me, even to the Hakape camp. I um, these postcards gave me an idea of the great uh, car. It, but didn't give me an idea of the dimension. Uh, I remembered, for instance, the large paintings on of Delacroix, uh, uh, printed on a small postcard, exactly the same size 
like the paintings of Vermeer, of the, the lace maker, who is a tiny painting that is more or less the size of a postcard. And only in 56, when I arrived to the Louvre, and I suddenly saw the enormous difference <laughs> that I was struck by, you know, I, I had to readapt memories that lived on in my mind now to a new dimension, the dimension of size. Okay, I'm going back again uh, to uh, get the times to 1942. Yeah. Uh, when uh, Sutskever and Kaczerginski gave an old manuscript to the young artist and asked him to draw everything what came to his mind. And then you write in your book, I had to leave a personal testimony on the pages of that book and save it from destruction. So I have two questions regarding it. Uh, one is, what did you draw there? And another one, don't you think that this book, uh, which has a name Pinkas, was kind of a mission, your mission, in, uh, in the ghetto? And um, it, it moved you forward, you know, because you have a very like uh, important mission to carry it and to save it. Yes, 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 of course. And some things a child can take literally, uh, but a child is only a child. I mean, a child can be extremely gifted, but a child remains a child. And uh, uh, I, I knew that this book had something in it very mysterious because I could not read the Hebrew of that book. That book was um, is today, uh, the Pinkas is today in the uh, Samuel Bach Museum in Vilnius. But uh, the book originally was part of a philanthropic uh, society of the Jewish community. It was uh, a book uh, called of Ohave Chesed. Um, it was a book in which there were some principles of the philanthropy and the helps and the various commissions that existed, but it was packed with names, lists of names of people who were in these different committees that were checking each other, that were controlling each other, that from year to year changed. And it is only with time, with years, that it dawned on, on, on me the importance of this book for the community and also what it represented as a symbol, the care for others. Uh, I mean, I as a child, I, I made it, so it all kinds of funny drawings of people laughing, of um, some things that were sad, like uh, myself hanging with my arms <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the branches of a, of, a, of, 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 of a tree, which you do not even see. You see just the kind of a flimsy branch to which I, I, I pour, put out my hands. And um, some images of Ulysses of the Greek, Greek mythology that I love, that I studied to, together with Rochele, and um, which I loved because it allowed me in my imagination to escape into, into other worlds. And I also remember that uh, Rochale gave me the book of um, of um, the Jewish writer from um, from uh, 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 Warsaw, Korczak. Uh, it was a book called um, uh, about the Invisible King, something like that. And uh, and I thought. It was incredible to become invisible, all the things that I could do if I were invisible and so. So uh, even in the ghetto itself, I had 
a life sometimes of satisfaction, of wonder, of uh, of of this relationship with with people like Sutskever. I, I I never realized then that Sutskever was the greatest Yiddish poet of the 20th century. I, I didn't know that. He, he was, and it's amazing that he had this interest for me. But uh, here we go. Some people are destined to become kind of uh, witnesses of history, and this has happened. And luck made me get also to that. So uh, now it's um, one question would be. Uh, from this side, that uh, Sutskever was the person who kind of introduced to you uh, what are the abstract expressionism or what are the, um, I don't know, other modernism kind of um, sources. Uh, and uh, actually, it's such a interesting coincidence that in the newly published book, uh, also he is remembering uh, your questions, uh, especially when you were remembering that he was the first one to introduce to you uh, the real world of art. Uh, what was out well, of I, I, I wouldn't say that he was the first, but he was so, somehow the connection with the great world. My mother uh, studied art in Vilnius. Uh, she wasn't able to be, um, you know, there was a, a new, numerous clauses uh, in the university, accepting only a small number of, of Jews. And uh, uh, if, you, uh, if they were women, it was even more difficult and uh, so on. So she, after she, she finished high school, uh, she studied some art, so she knew something. I don't think she was so well informed of what was going on in, in the big world. This Sutskever was. And um, uh, so, for instance, I remember Sutskever speaking to me of, of Cubism. And I tried to imagine, to invent a kind of... A, and you have in your collection some things that are, or even in, in the Pinkas, some things which are kind of my own interpretation based not on seeing but on hearing from Sutskip what cubism was <laughs> trying to reinvent and I, I, I must say that um, throughout many many years I had a contact with him until uh, when he was relatively old. And I remember meeting him in Paris. I remember meeting him in New York, uh, Tel Aviv, of course. Um, yes, Sutskiver at that time when I was in ghetto, I, and, and immediately after the ghetto, I didn't know that he was working for Ilya Ehrenburg and, and writing down so many things he and 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 Kashoginsky, which were supposed to be part of a book on the, of the destruction of the Jews, which then, when all the material was collected, the Russian authorities decided uh, uh, n uh, not to publish. And I mean, the, le the the rest is history. I don't have to tell you. I'm sure you know all about it. Uh, so actually. I can also show uh, to others that uh, Samuel Bach had painted a series of pillows. Uh, right. Yes, it's like, it's a lot of paintings related to the moment, to the second, when this pillow was left um, in the mud uh, that, uh, that while you were being taken to Vilna Ghetto. Uh, so uh, we can say also that your art was born from your miracle of survival, but also uh, your art is testimony of Holocaust. And so um, in numerous signs and numerous symbols go through, through all the uh, creation. And in a way um, that some memories like a pillow, let's say left, left in the mud, I think it's, um, also one of the key uh, symbols of your childhood, which was, you mentioned also that it was ended at the moment 
in a way that you had left home and to leave yeah. the spill. It's true. It's true. I mean, um, when I when I kind of moved from the art that I was producing in the mid sixties of last century and moved to a much more uh, realistic, figurative way of speaking. I think it really came because I felt that I had a story to tell, but I couldn't tell it directly. I could not speak of the horrors. I had to find a, a, a kind of metaphorical way of, of, of reaching out to all that. I also somehow felt at that time that the story that I wanted to speak about was not only a Jewish story. It was a story of humanity. It was a story of what men can do to men, of the worst and the best that lives on in most people. But according to condition, to circumstances, they can commit this or they can absorb that. I, I, I don't have to tell you that there is a very clear notion today uh, about um, abused uh, who become abusers. It is known that most abusers are children as children were abused. And um, and unfortunately, historically, this has happened to very many nations. And we cannot uh, speak today of the end of the of the liquidation of the ghetto of Vilnius, of this terrible sense of loss, of of of, of despair, of fragility without thinking what is happening right now, today, to Jews in Israel, a state which feels itself at the brink of existence. And what is the response? Can uh, traumatized people come up with rational solution? I don't know. I don't know. When I arrived to Israel, for instance, um, the fact that some people were expulsed from their homes in order to create homes for, for us was something that looked to me almost natural. Of course, this was done to me, so now it is done to them. Why some people who were not involved in the Holocaust had to pay for the price of our suffering, all of all these I started to think much later. I started to think in, in the times when I felt very insecure in Israel and I thought that I would not be able to go on a life in which I can dedicate myself to art when my uh, soul is taken over by the question of survival. And this woke up in me in the times of the Yom Kippur War. Uh, which was many, many years ago. It was in uh, 73. Uh, but you see, I mean, all these existential questions, they come on the surface even today when we speak, even today when in so many places people try to commemorate uh, the Jewish events. There are some other people who, with their logic and with their rights, say, but just a moment, let's also speak of the Palestinians. So, I mean, we live in a reality in which we realize suddenly that even if we are witnesses of a certain time, we must try to put all these events into the context of our lives, into the context of what we can learn what we can learn of those years. Uh, today, I am an American. Today, I live in a country in which the ignorance of the population is enormous. I mean, um, when, when you say to, I think, to the majority today of the American population, Vilnius, maybe they ever heard it. Uh, Oh, yes, it's in Portugal, right? No, maybe not in Portugal. So maybe it is in Norway. I mean, the, the, the ignorance is total. What happened in Europe in the 20th century, 
No one knows. No one knows here that there was a crisis in Germany in the 30s, that uh, Hitler was brought to power. Hitler, it was known when he was in prison in Landsberg after the, 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 the attempt of the uh, communists to seize uh, Bavaria in, 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 in the 20s, uh, he wrote Mein Kampf. Everyone knew what was his uh, what was his theory, but the German uh, intelligentsia, the German mainly the German industry, and so on, said he has a way with people. People love how he speaks. They have trust in him. It's true he's a clown, but let's give him the power. And this is how Hitler came to the world and came to the power and, and created this terrible, terrible destruction. And um, the destruction of the ghetto of Vilnius is, is one of the results. So um, uh, what can I say? I live today in America. We are in front of, we are, we are facing now um, we are facing now um, elections. Uh, what will be the result of the elections? We don't know. There is uh, uh, there is one um, person that uh, that is supposed to be uh, vice um, uh, vice president who says Ukraine, about Ukraine, let them just manage, let them just uh, take care of themselves. Doesn't interest me. This man is supposed to become the vice president of the United States. If I must mention the name that I don't like to dirty my lips with, if Mr. Trump is elected. Now, just imagine what will happen to Europe. Suddenly history repeats itself because things like the destruction of the ghetto of Vilna and the murder of millions is unknown. And the same friends of Mr. Trump who are negating the, the Holocaust, negating the Holocaust while Trump's own grandchildren, the children of his daughter Ivanka, are brought up as Jews. And as and will certainly learn as Jews about what get, happened in the ghetto of Warsaw, in the ghetto of Vilnius. I mean, how can we speak today of the tragedies of the past when we have, when we realize that somehow the lesson that we, that the world had to learn from them, not we, we know what has happened, but the world had to learn from, from them and it did not. So it's, uh, I, I must say, it's, it's, it's very difficult <laughs> to speak of these things and, 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 Say okay, so so what then? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I I, I I went into what is really working in my head. It's um... yeah. So uh, since your life is a whole, and in a way, what you have experienced in childhood, it it's it it made you as you are today. And uh, so for this reason, since we are, um, I believe, um, you know, going. Um, we are in the library and i'm i'm holding in my um in my hands i think one of the main albums uh, of your art and it is called return return to vilna and this is uh, a series of the artworks uh, you made right after your first trip when uh, let's say in 2001 and in 2002 when you yourself already came to vilnius as a um, mature man and in a way you commemorated Holocaust and reflected uh, reflected what had happened to you yes. and also uh, what I'm showing here this is a still life and this is a still life uh, with vessels um, it, it has uh, uh, also the piers also has uh, glass bottles and also has the arch of uh, Vilna ghetto, uh, like uh, also usually 
later on becoming um, a, as a rainbow promise uh, for I... the Jews. Uh, so uh, here we have numerous of symbols. Uh, later on, uh, you are working. And uh, as we know that the pear as a fruit uh, of knowledge and uh, it stands for uh, Paradise lost, what was your childhood, and also for the discovery of the war, what, is, uh, what was held to you and to all the population. And as far as I'm aware that um, the glass bottles and um, uh, it speaks about uh, uh, the, the life, the continuity of it, and in a way that the world had to be broken to be uh, repaired again, to be broken, to be repaired again. Uh, so uh, this uh, sort of, we can mention a Kabbalistic in a way, um, and it also tikkun alam, uh, meaning f uh, in right. this work and others. Uh, so uh, I believe that it is uh, happened uh, and, and and you created more of a series of artworks after you came to Vilnius uh, and you came into terms of what happened to you here during Holocaust. Absolutely. I, I, I must say um, you are sitting here next to Rimantas, who is the man who brought me to Vilnius. I must say I will never forget the day when Rimantas came to my home he was writing then about the Malina, the story of the Malina, the story of the people who were saved in the convent. And um, we kind of had a nice conversation. We, he, he was very charming. And, um, uh, and then at a certain point, he said, um, I, 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 I want to come to Vilnius to to the city. And I must say, this was a question that my wife has asked me several times. Let's go to Vilnius. And I said, no, I said, I, I simply cannot imagine myself confronting my memories with what is the reality of today. I cannot see myself bringing my, my, my old wounds that will never heal absolutely to the places which will reopen them. I was simply afraid. I was really afraid. But I I couldn't, I mean, Rimanta suddenly was for me a discovery of, of a Lithuanian who was not at all what I remember. <laughs> He was interested in me. He was open to our story. He 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 saw that it is very important to bear witness and to bring this past to light. And I just I couldn't say to him, no, leave, leave me in peace. I just to be more polite, I said, well, you know, if there would have been an occasion, an exhibition, for instance, I never imagined that there will be an exhibition of mine. So I kind of found something that I thought was a very good and pleasant excuse. So let this gentleman uh, leave. Somehow, I think it's also in my nature to try to give a good impression of myself. This is something that my mother taught me. You know, this was a kind of uh, a very Polish way of uh, uh, it was, um, it was, um, this is how uh, it's in my system. Okay. But then what happened is that uh, Rimantas left. And um, a few weeks later, Emanuele Zinger is telephones and says, uh, I am inviting you in the name of the Jewish community and the Lithuanian government and whatever to have an exhibition in the new museum that we are... Um, that we are now building. And it will be ready for the 23rd of September. Uh, this was in the beginning of the year and so on. And uh, you, you will bring a number of your uh, paintings. We will make the 
exhibition. And suddenly I was confronted there, here. I am invited in September to come to Vilnius. And so, so I said, yes, I could not say no to such a proposition. I suddenly felt it was really kind of my duty to take on myself what I have already done before that. You cannot imagine how many times I was, I was interviewed about the, the 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 Holocaust, about my own survival, about all the miracles that have given me life by the Israeli television, by the German television, by American. I mean, I have I have recorded I don't know how many hours put together will be more than weeks or months of my life speaking and telling this story. But suddenly I felt, well, now I must do it. I must do it again and in the place where it happened. So forget my wounds, forget my trauma, forget how I feel about it. I will do it. And then when I said yes, I took it myself. I told my wife, you know, let's go and, and visit Vilnius privately. Let's do it like this, incognito. And I want to see, I, because I cannot come to Vilnius with all these problems that I have and face an exhibition. I have to come there before. So in May, we travel to Vilnius, but Rimantas knew it. And Rimantas waited for us and he received us in the airport. And with, with the flowers, with Emanuele Zinger is there, with the people of the community, we were welcomed like, it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. Suddenly, I was being desired there. And, and, and so uh, if I say that Rimant has brought me to Vilnius in some way, he not only caused this thing, but with time. I remember when I came with, uh, when my first grandson had 13, I came with him. The Rantas was helping us out in all kinds of ways. When my second grandson was 13 and I came with him, Rimantas brought us to the office of the prime minister and the prime minister offered me a, a permanent place of exhibit of my work if I make a donation to... I mean, the way that Rimantas brought not only me, but also my art to Vilnius is, is absolutely extraordinary. I'm telling you all this because I could never thank him enough. I would could never thank him enough for all uh, that he did. And, uh, and, and I remember when in May we left, we left Vilnius, the two of us suddenly really felt that we are brothers. And I remember how we embraced and we both cried. I remember it was near the elevator of the hotel. So here we go. Here you have my, here you have our story. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next year we will celebrate twenty fifth anniversary yeah. of our brotherhood, of our friendship, and uh, I see this evening the persons, very important persons we, who participated in your face, uh, first visit in Vilnius. First of all, uh, Miralanda is uh, with us this evening. Wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, Maria Krupovets, a famous singer. You remember? Wow. Uh, we wow. spent yeah. evening uh, and she... Yes, in the theater, sitting, sitting on the stage of the, yes. of the theater of the ghetto. And yes. with her guitar. Oh my, oh my. Yes, I, I, uh, I don't saw you many years, but this a is... A magical, magical she moment. Is, she magical is uh, moment. together with us. Uh, together with us uh, this evening is uh, this... Uh, our... Uh, a famous, uh, famous uh, poetess, Indre Valentinaite, who wrote a poem about uh, your hiding place. And yeah. not only is she, now she wrote a new poem, Tikumolam. Uh, and I think that we will ask you to, to, to read. 
uh, this time in Lithuanian language, but uh, yeah. we will translate a little the context of this uh, poem, please, Indra. Thank you, Dimantas, and hello, Samuel. Hi. So it's a pleasure to meet you, at least via Facebook. So okay. thank you, thank you. I uh, <laughs> I am in front of you. <laughs> okay. I see you very well. So, yes, as Romantas said, the poem is in Lithuanian. I hope in a year or two it will be translated in English. And uh, unfortunately, is the it's it is the. Um, longest poem I have ever written, but later I will just tell you in a few words what, what it's all about. Tikun Olam Shi vakara mūsų susitikimo vieta bičiulių pamėgta vynininėties rūdininkų ir visų šventųjų gatvių kampų. Kart kartėmis Čia visus įrenkame užsimiršti, pasipasakoti ar padėkoti už dar vieną svaigiai besibaigiančią dieną. Žvangsi taurės, įsimilėlių nutūptos palangės, po jomis nukratomi cigarečių pelenai, mėtosi nubučiuotos nuorukos. Kaip tik šiandien, atsisveikinant, atsiglebėščiuojant su bičiuliais, netikėtai pakeliu galvą. Žvilgsnis užkliuvo už lentelės. Štai čia buvo didžiojo žydų gėto vartai. Atrodo, užsimerksi ir išgirsi tuos apmirusių žingsnius iš baimės linkstančių kojų trepsenimą. Išvysi vieną iš kelių mūsų mieste jau įvykusių pasaulio pabaigų. Tariu, pakelkim po dar vieną taurę už tai, kad šiandien tai vadinam praeitim ir istoriją. Įsivaizduojame kurgi tie vartai čia galėjo būti. Brėžiame ranka neregimas arkas. Kiekvienas išgasti įsitvėrė savo nešulio. Dokumentai ir nuotraukos, duona ir auksas. Lyg pabirė toros puslapiai ar nuplėšti angelų sparnai, gainiojami vėjo. Šioje minėje devinmetis Samuelis su pagalvė po pažastimi, raktu ant kaklo, ir auksas skūrė kreušę. Lyg perneštų per pragaros lengsti stebuklo pažada dešinėje. Kiekvienas siaubmetis atveria žaizdą, lyg plyšį gailestingumo medui ant sielų lašėti. Vėlyvas metas. Grįžtų namo, kraujų ir pelenais nesyki nuklotų mylimo miesto grindinių. Žvarbu. Per petį persimetų šalį, po kuriuo širdis ir lūpos meldžiasi skubrių žingsnių ritmų. Kad niekad, niekad, niekad klaikas nebeužslinktų, neatsikartotų. Bent jau šiame mieste, kuris nesiderėdama sumokėjo kainą. Kad išliktų gyvų, vis dar tebe rašomų, alsuojančių eilėraščių. Tikun. Olam. Thank you for listening so patiently. And um, actually, I'm just telling a story. Um, as I imagined, you, nine-year-old boy, um, going to the ghetto, to the narrow streets of Vilnius with a that pillow under your uh, arm and uh, um, key hanging on, on your uh, chest and also um, just keeping a pear in your right arm, in your right arm hand. Uh, and uh, the pear is um, in gold. As you know, uh, kings, kings and queens usually have these regals. Yeah, sure. English. Yeah, so yeah, and the eggs is a fabric of pear. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of a promise uh, for yeah. you to, you know, um, to survive. So it's it's actually a very long poem. It's about Vilnius, but in the center of it, 
It is you and the symbols we usually find in, in your paintings. And uh, it's kind of a prayer also that um, I'm, I'm asking not never to repeat that the end of the world that, that already had happened in Vilnius once, it should never repeat again. And um, I find it really meaningful then, for example, two days ago, yes, it was Sunday, and uh, we had readings uh, in, um, in Pilias Street uh, through the open uh, windows from Signature's house. And they really had all these microphones, all the um, volume, and it sounded like kind of a. I really do believe in in this um, power of uh, art, as paintings, as poetry. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I I want to ask uh, Milda Bredikaite to talk a little bit about art books uh, of yours uh, here in library. We have 15 your art books and uh, she wants to, to talk of importance of this. Okay, hello, uh, good evening. Uh, actually it's evening in Vilnius, but maybe I can say also in Polish, Dobry wieczór, Pan Samuel. So actually this is improvised uh, situation. <laughs> this nice Riemann has just asked me to tell a little bit about the shelf, but I think in the library, and I'm sure that the library is proud of it, and, and Riemann is proud, and I had time to look through it, and there are 15 and even more, 16, 18 books that are just not your paintings, but also their serious studies of your art. So uh, I, I hope and I believe it is just a beginning, so... It's coming, more books are coming, but um, uh, I have chosen one book with your, your pictures, your paintings, and with poems by Carol Dine. Uh, you know the book. And Rimantas asked me to choose a poem or two to read in English. So I have to, uh, uh, to, to tell that Maybe I was reading poem in English when I was in first grade. So in school, where I was very close to your hiding place and to your home. So, but now I, I, I will try to do my best. Okay, by Carol Dine from the book Orange Night. I have taken the liberty of extending Carol Dine's poem only because today is a special occasion. I hope Carol will forgive me. Wall, an archway waltz over the courtyard, the stone enchanted by the rosette light. After the storming, disposed keys flood the alley. Some have turned copper blue, others are circular like wedding rings. At dusk, their shadows scratch at the ghetto wall. Yes, you can show the picture. And one, mm, and one more. Letters, block letters that should be in a boy's room, perhaps on a shelf. Instead, they are carved in a giant boulder on his father's yard set, the stone lift. Jonas, July 1944. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us all. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, she, was, uh, she was a wonderful poet. Uh, she passed away. Carol passed away of, of cancer some years ago. She was a very good, she became a very good friend, but she wrote her poems actually when she saw my paintings before, before, 
we met. Yeah, very moving. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, so Samuel, as you already underst understood, um, uh, so now, from now, from today, here at the uh, Vilnius Public uh, Jewish Library, we have a shelf dedicated to you, uh, uh, and it's filled with uh, books about you and um, about your work. Um, and also, uh, it's a good time to mention that book you mentioned, Notapita Georgi, is painted with words. Um, we have this book uh, in our libraries, so, and you are all welcome to come and to take it and to read it if you if you didn't until now. Uh, and now it's time for questions. Samuel, hello. Samuel, hey. hello. Uh, uh, very, very Hi. simple question. Are you planning to come to Vilnius one more time? And please uh, know that. Uh, taxi services will be free of charge for you <laughs> as it was the first time thank you, uh, thank Sam, you. let uh, me let me answer this question yeah. because i know answer as we talked last time in april last year i promised to collect money and to buy personal plane yeah, right and it will be right possibility to you arrive here so it's belong from me if i succeed yeah. collect Maybe money is enough money for to plane, buy. for personal plane so i'm not, well, let I'm, me, not let a, I'm not a pilot but i'm a driver so driving services yeah, will be free you. of charge thank you thank you so much do we have more questions Oh, Samuel, it's, it's, it's not a question, but uh, I am very, very happy to see you in such good shape, in Thank you. <laughs> great spirit, and as always, with, with incredible sense of humor. <laughs> Thank I you. hope you see in Vilnius. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you. Um, uh, if uh, we don't have uh, more questions, and uh, actually it's time already uh, to finish our meeting, uh, I would ask maybe Dominika, you can show Samuel uh, how many people gather and who and who gather here, and we will say goodbye to Samuel um, for now. And uh, as it was mentioned, uh, you know we are always uh, waiting for you here in Vilnius. And um, while you're here, uh, we would be happy to have you here at the library, sitting here well, next well, to I'm us. I'm now with you. Uh, <laughs> you know, even with my own children, we are connected via Zoom. Every Sunday at noontime, we are together. We are a family, a close family that is spread between France, Switzerland, Israel, South Africa, uh, and, and Boston. It's not very simple, but, but every Sunday on the large uh, screen of the computer, we are together with their cats and their dogs, and we spend at least an hour or two hours telling stories, laughing together. And I must say that I do not have a feeling that I haven't seen them just a few days ago. It is absolutely wonderful. I don't think that we ever felt as close as we are now, thanks to the digital um, uh, possibility of, of really being together and being all of us together, which physically was impossible because we are so scattered in the world. So I think that Zoom is a fantastic invention and, uh, and we have really taken um, advantage of of it in the most wonderful way today absolutely absolutely and we and actually do not hesitate and do not hesitate and, and i mean uh, yeva knows already what it is to have a weekly meeting with me 
and <laughs> uh, when there are things of interest and so on, I, I, I can always find the time. I, I think it is extremely important for me. For me, what you are doing now, this is a tikkun olam, actually. You are kind of showing that there is another side of humanity, the humanity that builds and that repairs. Re repairing is actually uh, the repairing of the world. Repairing is a basic element of life. I mean, even the COVID virus, it is now scientifically explained. Why did it become weaker and weaker? Why do not people, as many people as before, die? It is because in some strange way, the virus did not want to kill the people. The virus needs people in order to go on living. So it decided to be less mortal. So you see, even the viruses that kill us try to repair something. So here we go. It's part of life. It's part of life, and we all repair things. I mean, I must repair now the roof. I must repair a chimney. I must repair a window that was broken. And, and every day I repair paintings. I start a painting, I thought it was finished and so on. I looked at it again, I said, oh my goodness, it's wrong. It has to be repaired. So when I write, I write something, it looks okay. I reread it the next day, impossible. I must repair it here. I wrote, I wrote a, lot, a small introduction for you, Eva, for the catalog of my work. I wrote it, I said, well, it will take me a day or two. I, I worked on it for almost two weeks. Why? Because I wrote it and then it was, it had to be repaired and I repaired it and the repairing was bad. So the repairing had to be repaired and then I had to rewrite it. And so, and finally, I knew that I cannot do any better than that. This is my limitation. So this is how it is, we repair. And it's thank you so much for it, for all the repairs that you are doing. It's absolutely wonderful. It's so it's so rewarding for me to have this part of me alive today in uh, Vilnius. You cannot imagine how part of it is because I knew that somehow I knew that my family expected from me a lot. And the possibility that I had to prove to them that I have achieved something, that I have touched the lives of others. You know, it's an extraordinary, I mean, uh, the, the way the mantas has touched my life in a way that is unbelievable. I mean, I could not describe my gratitude to him. I mean, we, I, I told him once, stop saying the word thanks you because the thank you doesn't mean enough what 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 we what we what we feel to each other the the miracle of life the, the miracle that you know I'm an atheist and I do not believe in in determination and and I don't believe it was meant to be I don't believe in all these things what I believe is in chance and I believe that when one is alert and one catches the chance when it just passes by as the Chinese say the sound of the wings of a bird behind the back of a blind man. This is chance. Uh, when you catch the chance, it's, it's extraordinary. And I'm, I'm trying to catch the chance. And, and, and when, when I see how my paintings, they kind of land in the, in the, in the souls of people, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And it cannot, happen without the help of others. You need really people to help you to do what you are trying to do because without the help of other people, you will be never able to move. So I, I had a great chance of having all of you come and, and, and try to create a bridge between me and, and the people. 
And it is not only because this wonderful thing of the communication that exists between humans, but it also the effects that it can have. So, thank you, gratitude. Samuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And <laughs> uh, I guess we have finished the evening, right? Yes. So, uh, so thank you. Thanks again. Uh, let's continue to repair. Let's continue, continue to be in touch. Oh, and absolutely. I hope it's not our last meeting here. We will find another teams to talk. And now when uh, we have a shelf, we have to you know, fill it uh, with more books. Um, thank you all for coming here uh, tonight. Uh, it's a great chance to announce about another event here uh, at the library. It will happen on Thursday. We'll have a um, uh, um, presentation uh, about um, we will be searching in our Lithuanian history uh, roots of uh, uh, religious community, which is now um, um, a, a, a religious community in Israel. And uh, among us, uh, we have a, a presenter uh, of this uh, lecture, uh, Aaron Aritan from Israel. So please uh, come on Thursday at six o'clock, um, and we will be talking about uh, many interesting things. And um, so thanks again. And uh, see you next time, Samuel. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. All the best to you. And thank you for all the work that you are doing. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, Bye -bye. my dear friend.